Um, I am Margaret Gam, Director of Special Collections and Archives at the University of Iowa Libraries. I would like to thank you for joining us today. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that the University of Iowa is located on the historical homelands of over 15 tribal nations, the Omaha Tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska, Meskwaki, and Ho-Chunk Nations continue to thrive in the state of Iowa. We continue to acknowledge them. To help you start your own exploration of these histories of Iowa and its people, we encourage you to take a look at the links that will be provided in the Zoom chat or in the YouTube video description. So today, Dr. Anna Barker will provide a new look at the exhibit from Revolutionary Outcast to A Man of God, Dostoevsky at 200, which will be closing this month after a highly successful run. Dr. Barker is visiting assistant professor in the Asian and Slavic Languages and Literature Department at the University of Iowa. She has organized and hosted many community events over the years, especially public readings of Russian literature and screenings of film adaptations. The exhibit she's discussing today is the best attended in gallery history, which is no small feat considering COVID complications. So many congratulations to Dr. Barker on that success, since I know her excitement about sharing Dostoevsky with others contributed in a very large part to that success. So now I will turn it over to Dr. Barker so that uh, we can enjoy some of that enthusiasm today. Wonderful, thank you so much, Margaret. And I'm going to reverse my camera so that I would be able to show you how we utilize the space for this exhibition. So let me just do that now. Wonderful, so now you see the exhibit itself. And I'm going to take off my shawl because I'm getting a little warm here. Um, I'm standing at the front vitrine, and you can see shawls, birch trees, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit. And then the exhibition works counterclockwise. So you are seeing the section about young Dostoevsky. You are seeing the section about his um, Siberia exile years. You see a portrait by Pirov, and we use this as a main image for the entire exhibition. This painting um, of Dostoevsky is by the Russian painter Pirov, and it was commissioned by um, Pavel Tretyakov for the Tretyakov Gallery. It is exhibited at the Tretyakov Gallery today, and uh, it is considered to be the most important portrait of Dostoevsky. And then after this, we get to the gambler section of Dostoevsky's life. Yes, that was very exciting. He gambled away so much money. And then we get to the profit section. And um, let me actually go outside and um, show the gallery to those of you who may not be familiar with the University of Iowa Gallery. So I'm going to exit, and this is the entrance to the library. So the gallery is accessible as soon as you enter the building. And um, here you see the main window of, uh, of the exhibition, the main, uh, the main vitrine. The um, title of the exhibition is prominently displayed. And um, everyone is able to um, access this space um, from two different doors. So very easy access to the exhibition. I know that a lot of you are interested in um, not just the exhibition itself, but how exhibitions are put together. So I'm going to focus on that for this particular tour, which is my tour number, I don't know, 10,025. <laughs> Let's just say it this way. Um, so you see these birches um, that we have on display here and also these lovely autumn leaves. And um, there are some pancakes on a plate and, um, and a Russian samovar. What I wanted to create in this front vitrine is an invitation, an invitation to Russian culture and specifically an invitation into the world of Dostoevsky. So on this wall here, we have the last page of Brothers Karamazov, which has something to do with pancakes. So this is an, an invitation into the world of Dostoevsky. Um, Brothers Karamazov is his final novel. And so it's an homage to all things Russian and all things Dostoevsky. Um, as, and as I like to point out during my tours, these birches have a very um, remarkable literary pedigree. They were used, <clears throat> sorry, they were used at the University of Iowa Theater Department for production of Chekhov's Three Sisters. And um, as I was putting together this exhibition, I remembered the birch grove that they had. Uh, we contacted the theater department and they were very happy to share their birches with us. And of course the birches are made out of paper, <laughs> the leaves, that you see down below, the maple leaves are made of silk and the pancakes are made of plastic. <laughs> this is a, an archival library um, exhibition and we, we made sure that all of the rules are observed. 
Um, the samovar, um, I actually got it on Etsy. I looked for a Russian 19th century brass samovar and it came beautifully packaged. Um, it's, um, it's from the city of Tula. That's where um, Russian samovar manufacturing was very prominent in the 19th century. Um, and on this panel right here, opposite the, the quote from Brother Skarmazov about pancakes, um, I have extensive commentary on all the objects displayed in the front vitrine. So there is a painting by the Russian painter Kustodiev of a merchant's wife having tea. And you see a samovar right here, jam in a beautiful dainty dish, fruit and crackers and little bits to eat. Of course, a lovely Russian kitty and a church in the background. And then there's information about the china on display. It's from the uh, Russian Imperial Porcelain um, Factory. Um, information about some of our manufacturing in Russia in the 19th century. Information about Russian pancakes and how they are eaten and why they are eaten in Russia. Information on Russian shawls. You see uh, several shawls on display here. They are all from uh, the city of Pavlova Pasad, which is the number one shawl manufacturing city in Russia and an homage to um, Isaac Levitan, the Russian painter who painted this lovely birch grove, who was actually a friend of Chekhov. So do you see how everything in the space is an invitation to the exhibition and everything is connected from the quote about pancakes from Brothers Karamazov to the little pancake party to tea um, and um, these very Chekhovian birch trees um, and a birch grove painted by Chekhov's friend Isaac Levitan. Um, and I'm actually going to go backwards in this exhibition. I'm going to go to the section entitled Profit first. And um, I will focus on how we utilize the space specifically for this exhibition. So you see the section is entitled Profit and every section has the, um, the um, section title in both English and in Russian. In Russian, it's Prarok. Um, this particular vitrine, which I learned to, I learned the, the numbering of all of the vitrines in this, in this um, space. And this is vitrine number nine. And it's quite long, but as you can see, it consists of five sections. And so um, our choice was dictated by the space because Dostoevsky's final five novels, and they are Crime and Punishment, The Idiot, Demons, Adolescent, and Brother Skaramazov are considered to be his five prophetic novels. So do you see how as soon as I entered the space and started working on this exhibition, I knew that the five prophetic works are going to go into one of the long retreats. And uh, we were incredibly fortunate to unearth a treasure that is housed in the University of Iowa Special Collections. We found special editions of these five novels with stunning illustrations by the German-American illustrator Fritz Eichenberg. So here you see the illustration for um, Crime and Punishment, and you see um, a Russian cross with an X, and Raskolnikov with an X, and then that Russian cross with an X is on the cover of this book. So four of these novels are um, published in two volume um, limited um, limited um, edition um, because there are so many illustrations and you can see that the books are quite large. Um, so The Idiot is the only uh, of the five novels that comes in just one, one, one volume. The other four are all in two volumes. What I absolutely love about the, the um, illustrations of Fritz Eichenberg for The Idiot is this particular illustration and it's, it's my absolute favorite. Um, you can see that in the vitrine dedicated to the idiot, we have the title, the idiot, and um, in Russian, it's idiot, and my commentary about the novel. And then down below, you see um, the image of uh, Hans Holbein, the younger, the body of that Christ in the tomb, which was painted in the 16th century. Dostoevsky saw this painting in Basel, and according to the recollections of his wife, Anna Grigorievna Dostoevsky, it made an absolutely stunning impact on him. She was worried that Dostoevsky will have an epileptic fit while looking at this painting in the art gallery in Basel, Switzerland. And Dostoevsky, um, Dostoevsky's The Idiot is really an homage to his meditation on the significance of this painting. One of the characters in the novel has this painting, or a copy of this painting, placed above the doorway in his house. Um, and Dostoevsky um, has two characters engage in a meditation on the nature of faith, 
while one of the characters observes that he can lose one's faith uh, while looking at this painting. And so what Fritz Eichenberg does in his illustration to this limited edition of The Idiot, you can see that there are two characters depicted in this illustration. Um, they are Mushkin, who uh, incidentally has epilepsy. Dostoevsky gave his illness to this character and Agozhin. And you can see these two characters engaged in an exchange of crosses, but look right above their heads. Do you see what Eichenberg depicted in, um, in this illustration? It is the Holbein Christ. So it is absolutely incredible to what extent Fritz Eichenberg didn't just pay very close attention to everything that Dostoevsky was trying to convey in this novel, just from physical appearance of the characters to some of the concepts that Dostoevsky focused on, but also Fritz Eichenberg is fully aware of the inspirations of Dostoevsky from other works of art. And so that is included in this illustration, which I absolutely love. So we have the two volume Fritz Eichenberg Crime and Punishment, one volume Fritz Eichenberg The Idiot, and then going to the novel Demons, or in Russian it's Bessi. We have a fabulous two volume illustration once again, uh, illustrated version uh, by, uh, illustrated by Fritz Eichenberg. And I love what he is trying to accomplish here. You can see only three of the horsemen, but if you open this book, um, on the cover, you see the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And uh, uh, Fritz Eichenberg um, is conveying that there's no, there's no reference to the four horsemen of the apocalypse in the novel, um, but Fritz Eichenberg understands the concepts that Dostoevsky is exploring in this novel. And so he puts the four horsemen of the apocalypse, definitely, this apocalyptic vision that Dostoevsky has um, and conveys in this novel on the cover of, um, of both volumes. And then uh, we have the second volume opened on part three and you see this character who looks very much like um, St. George, but instead of defeating a dragon, he's defeating a demon, a devil. And once again, um, Fritz Eichenberg works with traditional um, George and the dragon iconography, but substitutes the, uh, the demon for the dragon because of the title of the novel, um, Demons. And um, I love the juxtaposition that we created in this particular case, because right here, you see my grandmother's Russian icon of St. George defeating a dragon. And we juxtapose that with the Fritz Eichenberg illustration for this particular uh, novel. And in Russian, um, St. George is uh, Georgi Pobedonosets. Um, and so, um, in, in this case, we actually have a few of my uh, grandmother's icons. Um, there's um, one of St. Nicholas, who is patron saint of Russia, and we placed it in the uh, crime and punishment section. But this particular juxtaposition of the St. George and the dragon icon next to the Fritz Eichenberg illustration for demons is very, very fitting. And then moving on, we are looking at the novel Adolescent or Podrostek in Russian. Uh, once again, an, an absolutely beautiful illustrated version um, by Fritz Eichenberg. And we see the main character, Arkady Belgaruki, who is our teenager, the adolescent. He's, he's a little too old to be an adolescent, but Dostoevsky explains why his 19-year-old character, why he considers his 19-year-old character an adolescent. And, um, and for Brothers Karamazov, we have both volumes opened on very significant moments in the novel. Now this one, Alyosha, Dostoevsky's um, soul character, um, coming to terms with his faith and his humanity. And in the other vitrine, or in the, uh, the other book, is in the same vitrine is opened um, on the page depicting the, um, Fritz Eichenberg's illustration for the Grand Inquisitor chapter. Um, and it's fascinating if you look at um, one of the other cases we have here, and this is the section that we entitled Inspired by Dostoevsky, uh, where we have um, uh, works by Kafka, Orwell, and Huxley. As a matter of fact, Huxley mentions the Grand Inquisitor in his Brave New World Revisited, and this is a first edition of the novel, and we have it displayed here. Um, it's a copy from the University of Iowa Special Collections. But we also, uh, the Grand Inquisitor chapter of Brothers Karamazov is often printed in a separate edition, um, just that one chapter from the entire novel. And we have the um, Fritz Eichenberg illustrated uh, version of the Grand Inquisitor with the Fritz Eichenberg uh, portrait of Dostoevsky, and it is signed by the illustrator. Um, so wonderful, wonderful information here. And then um, right here is a portrait of Fritz Eichenberg 
and um, all the information we need about his prolific work as an illustrator. He didn't just illustrate Dostoevsky, he illustrated Tolstoy, Charlotte and Emily Bronte, Edgar Allan Poe, Jonathan Swift, and his um, most favorite medium um, was the woodcut engraving. Um, and so with this stunning display of the five great prophetic novels in, a, um, in um, an exhibition case, that has five sections, <laughs> we were wondering what to do was the other section. And I see um, Sarah here. And um, so I'm going to walk up to the case that is opposite the, um, the prophet case, right? So we entitled this case Rebel and in Russian, Mityashnik. And um, so of course it's juxtaposed to the, the prophet section, right? And so we needed to create something that would have the same kind of weight and significance. And yet, what can you place in the section that also has five subsections, right? That would counterbalance crime and punishment, the idiot, demons, brothers Karamazov, um, and the adolescent. It, it's, it's impossible. And so in this case, we got a lot of help from Eric in Special Collections, who had a brilliant idea. Um, well, of course, we had to talk about Dostoevsky's early life. So we have a section entitled The Beginning, and we talk about um, his education, his parents, and his first three published books, um, Poor Folk, The Double, White Knights, and then To Siberia, the story of his imprisonment and um, sentencing and his exile to Siberia. And Eric's contribution was absolutely brilliant, and I really appreciate his help. He felt that um, viewers of this exhibition would be interested in finding out about Russia itself. And so he suggested since Dostoevsky was born in Moscow, despite the fact that most of his novels take place, take, take place in St. Petersburg, um, Eric unearthed this absolutely gorgeous book published in 1815 in London. And it's a travel guide to Russia. <laughs> I joke during my tours that um, the publisher in London probably thought, okay, well, the French just left Moscow and yeah, it burned down, but they rebuilt it. So it's time to travel to Russia. And um, we um, opened this book on an illustration of the Moscow Kremlin, because it's the most iconic building in, um, in Moscow. Um, and um, so Dostoevsky, a Moscovite by birth, um, creates most of his works in St. Petersburg. And so this book was published in Paris in 1854. And Eric suggested that we display this book as well. And this book is open on a page depicting the statue of Peter I or Peter the Great, uh, which was commissioned by Catherine the Second, Catherine the Great. And the, the nickname of this um, statue is the Bronze Horseman. That nickname comes from a Pushkin poem that is called the Bronze Horseman, Mednev Sadnik in Russian. So yes, we have these amazing, amazing books. This one from 1815, um, published in London, and this one from 1844, uh, 40, sorry, 1854, um, published in Paris. And um, if we fast forward to the Siberia, uh, Siberia um, exile, um, this book was also recommended by Eric and I absolutely love it because um, this book was published in 1914, but it's a facsimile reproduction of the 1914 edition that was published in um, 1971. And it is a great map of Russia because on the left right here, it starts at the Ural Mountains and the Caspian Sea. And on the further right, right there, it ends um, on its border with, um, with Japan and the Sea of Japan and its border was, um, was China and Manjuria. So we have a great map depicting Russian Siberia, which is very helpful. And a lot of uh, viewers of the exhibition actually were surprised just how much of Russia is in, um, in Asia um, on the other side of the Ural Mountains. And also um, there's an absolutely amazing catalog of the exhibition. I'm going to um, um, open it on um, the page that um, we need. And what I love about the catalog and what, what Sarah was able to accomplish in the catalog, I'm going to show you the map. So do you see um, we have this map in the catalog and there are three cities highlighted in the catalog on this map. And those cities are Taborsk, Omsk, and Semipalatinsk, the three cities that, that are associated with Dostoevsky's exile to Siberia. So um, very interactive map. Um, 
And if we uh, pick up the guide, we can definitely place the Stayevsky on this map. Um, what other interesting things we tried to um, accomplish was utilizing the space? Um, well, the corners. <laughs> corners are always these awkward things. And I wanted to make sure that our corners are utilized and our corners are interesting. So in the first corner, we have a portrait of Dostoevsky, which is the first portrait of Dostoevsky. Um, it, he was 26 years old uh, when this portrait was, um, was drawn. It's by Konstantin um, Trutovsky. It was executed in 1847, um, just two years before his Siberian exile. And it's housed at the State um, Literature Museum in Moscow. And then as you guessed it, you guessed it correctly. So the other corner, contains the last portrait of Dostoevsky and a little bit of information about his, uh, his death. Um, it is one of the last photographs taken of Dostoevsky and um, information about um, the causes of his death, which was pulmonary hemorrhage. He died on um, February 9, um, 1881, um, just a few months after the publication of Brothers Karamazov. And so the other corners, uh, we, um, we connected with the events that were happening in his life during this time period. Um, in the, so we have the, the corner with his uh, purse portrait. Then we have the long uh, five-section vitrine focusing on his um, parentage and his education, his first three publications, Poor Folk, The Double, and White Knights, his exile to Siberia. And of course, in this corner, we have the portrait of his first wife. He met her in, in Siberia. Um, they got married when he was um, <clears throat> still living in Siberia and he did, not, he did not know whether he will ever be able to return to European Russia. Um, and so the portrait of this first very unhappy marriage for Dostoevsky um, is, um, is placed in, um, in the second corner and then of course, if we are following the exhibition, the convict section is, um, is the next one, convict or katarznik in Russian. And then in the third um, or the, the third corner, we have the portrait of his second wife. And um, I will pause here for a second because I need to talk to you about the gambler or the igrok section, um, because he meets his second wife um, when he is attempting to write a, a second novel in, um, in the same year that he's writing um, and serializing um, Crime and Punishment. Um, this section here, because we are Iowa City, right? And everyone in Iowa City is a writer. We have a fabulous writing program. I thought that we should um, have a little bit of emphasis on publishing. And so I decided to have an entire panel dedicated to uh, Mikhail Katkov, who was the editor of a Russian monthly called The Russian Messenger for 20 years. And um, let me just uh, explode your imagination by giving you a list of all the books that were serialized in his magazine during his tenure as, a, as the chief editor. So Turgenev's On the Eve, Fathers and Sons and Smoke, Tolstoy's Family Happiness, The Cossacks, War and Peace, and Anna Karenina, so that the Stayevsky's, The Village of Stepanchikov, A Crime and Punishment, Idiot Demons, and Brothers Karamazov. So imagine that you are Russian writers in 1866, or Russian readers in 1866, and you're subscribing to the Russian Messenger, that year, every single month, you would um, receive the next installment of War and Peace and the next installment of Crime and Punishment in the same issue, which is nothing short of remarkable. And so, but of course, in order to finish Crime and Punishment, Dostoevsky needs to have money. All of the books that you have on display here were written because Dostoevsky needed money. And um, he makes a deal with another publisher whose name is Stilovsky, for the publication of a second novel that same year, 1866. And Stilovsky wants this novel of substantial length. Um, they specified the number of pages by November 1. Um, but here's the catch. If Dostoevsky does not deliver the novel, Stilovsky will own the rights to everything Dostoevsky publishes for the next nine years. Why nine years? Because Dostoevsky was the prisoner of the state for nine years. And Stilovsky feels that he's going to be his intellectual prisoner for nine years. The man had an ego. It's October 1. Remember, this, this manuscript is due on um, November 1. It's October 1. Not a single line of this novel has been written. Dostoevsky's friends panic. <laughs> and so they have a plan. They hire a stenographer who would come and take dictation from Dostoevsky every day so that he would finish this novel. 
And of course, the stenographer is the young Anna Grigorievna Snitkina. Um, she's 18 years old. She just graduated from stenography courses. And um, here in the Gambler um, uh, case, we have her memoirs opened on October 4 of 1866, the day when she met Dostoevsky. Um, on, the, on the panel, so we have her portrait on one side of the panel in this corner, and then we have excerpts from her diary that talk about those early months of, um, of their meeting or early weeks of, of their meeting. And then also on display here, we have information about a Russian film that was made in 1981 entitled 26 Days in the Life of Dostoevsky. So all this is dedicated to those 26 days in the course of which Dostoevsky finished his novel, The Gambler. And um, um, he rushed over to uh, Stilovsky's house uh, when the novel was finished on October 31. And of course, Stilovsky is not a fool. He was not at home. The servant said, I, I have no idea where he is. I haven't seen him all day. Well, Dostoevsky is not a fool either. He rushed to a police station and asked the chief of police to give him a dated timed receipt. And so it was an official document, could not be argued in court. Dostoevsky won. And uh, this lovely young lady became his second wife, his muse, his lover, um, the mother of the two children. Well, they had four children together. Two of them uh, lived to adulthood, um, who also became his publisher. So after all of these amazing novels were serialized in The Russian Messenger, Anna Grigorievna Snitkina managed to not just publish the novels, but publish his collected works, uh, which was a much, um, much larger source of income. And you are probably looking at this section right here where we have a beautiful illustrated version of the gambler. You see people playing roulette. Um, the, in the gambler, Dostoevsky actually um, calls the town Roulettenburg. <laughs> and um, much gambling happens. It's set in Germany in the German town of Roulettenburg, fictional town. But you also are looking at um, a record case of Sergei Prokofiev's opera based on the gambler called The Gambler. And then in this corner, we have information about Sergei Prokofiev. Um, it happened to be his first opera, and then um, the, um, an image from the um, uh, 2010 production of The Gambler at the Mariinsky Theater in St. Petersburg. Um, and the section um, about the opera based on The Gambler is actually juxtaposed with a section in the, um, in the convict um, area of the, um, of the exhibition where we are focused on another opera based on, um, on Dostoevsky's um, work, this time um, his novel from the House of the Dead. And we see here convict shackles displayed. Um, they are authentic 19th century Central European convict shackles. Dostoevsky was shackled for all four years of his hard labor service in the prison colony in Omsk. Um, but here we have on display um, the score of Leo Janáček's Zmertvého domu, or From the House of the Dead, his opera based on Dostoevsky's um, um, House of the Dead, or Notes from the Dead House. And um, right here, we have information about Leo Janáček and an image from a Metropolitan Opera production of um, From the House of the Dead, uh, which, um, which was done in 2009. It's fascinating. Leos Janáček was such a huge fan of Russian literature that not only did he write the opera for, uh, from the House of the Dead, he wrote the libretto from the opera. But that's not all. <laughs> the, the, I mean, this places him into a category of composers such as Boito or Wagner, who wrote both the librettos and the libretti or the, and the music uh, for the operas. But also he knew Russian. So he actually translated Dostoevsky's Notes from the Dead House into Czech, then based his own libretto on his translation, and then he wrote the music based on his libretto. And then Janáček and Prokofiev are the only two composers that wrote substantial uh, musical compositions bo based both on Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Um, so Janáček's opera uh, from the House of the Dead is based on Dostoevsky's novel, and his um, string quartet, the Kreutzer Sonata, is based on Tolstoy's novella, the Kreutzer Sonata. And Prokofiev, of course, wrote the opera War and Peace um, in the 1940s based on Tolstoy's War and Peace. And he wrote his first opera was, uh, was The Gambler based on Dostoevsky. And I've been studiously avoiding the central section of this exhibition. So here 
there's information about um, Dostoevsky's funeral. And, um, and um, it's very important to show in the section where we have the title of the exhibition, um, Dostoevsky's portrait, but also we have a photograph of his um, gravestone. And um, it's very important because um, the inscription that he has on his gravestone is the same as the epigraph to Brothers Karamazov and it's his final novel. So those are really important words for Dostoevsky and I will read to you the English translation. It's John 12, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And I point out that Dostoevsky's vision in this case is quite prophetic because here we are in the 21st century still talking about him and still discussing him. And uh, the seeds that he planted are indeed quite fruitful because um, they are bringing, bringing us much joy and uh, much reason for serious intellectual discussion. And the one thing that you are not hearing in this exhibition right now is the sound of the exhibition. So I wanted to involve more than just our ability to read. I wanted um, at attendees of the exhibition to listen to this exhibition. And right here, there's information about the music that is, um, is heard um, every single day from the opening of the exhibition to the closing of the exhibition daily. Uh, uh, this section is entitled Sacred Sounds, and we have music written for the church by Russian composers such as um, Rachmaninov, Chesnakov, Tchaikovsky, um, and lesser known um, composers such as Steinberg and um, uh, Kostalsky. All of this music is choral music. Um, Russian church music um, derives from the Byzantine tradition or Eastern Christian tradition where no musical instruments are used in um, church music. So no trumpets, no organs, it's all choral singing. And so throughout the day from the moment the exhibition opens to um, when the exhibition closes, there's absolutely beautiful, beautiful singing um, that can be heard. Um, and um, it complements the exhibition and especially it complements this, this section of Dostoevsky entitled The Prophet um, because there's something um, deeply spiritual in um, many of his, um, not many, in all of his, um, in all of his late works. Um, his novels actually focus on um, miracles that can be encountered in the New Testament. Um, every single one of the late novels um, deals with a miracle in crime and punishment. It is, of course, the, um, the resurrection of Lazarus in demons. It's that moment where um, um, a demoniac comes to Christ and Christ exercises the demons. And of course, they, uh, they go into some swine, the swine rush off the cliff and the demoniac sits at the feet of Christ um, in his right mind. That's where the title of the, of the novel comes from. It's those demons. And um, that passage from the New Testament is actually the epigraph to this novel. And of course, in Brothers Karamazov, um, the miracle is the first miracle of Christ. It's the, the wedding at Cana, the turning of water into wine. And that is the focal um, miraculous event that occurs several times in the course of Brothers Karamazov. I think I am done with my tour at this point, um, and I would welcome questions. And um, um, if you want me to walk over to a certain section of the exhibition and focus on it, um, I would be more than happy to show you some of the books. And while you are thinking of questions, um, I'm going to focus on this section. And here we have three books on display. The first one is Ivan Turgenev's Fathers and Sons. The second one, Nikolai Chernyshevsky's What's to be Done. And the third one is Dostoevsky's Notes from the Dead House, was a nice big quote um, from the book Notes from the Dead House. And um, I thought this would be a great way to show the literary influence that Dostoevsky had. So Turgenev writes his novel Fathers and Sons, and that's the first book on display. Chernyshevsky reads it, and he feels that um, Turgenev does not go far enough in his exploration of this new revolutionary spirit that is roaming in Russia. And so he writes his revolutionary novel, What's to be Done? Incidentally, um, Lenin's favorite novel um, that he reread multiple times in the course of one summer and um, that really inspired his revolutionary zeal. And then Dostoevsky reads both Turgenev and Chernyshevsky and his response to these two Russian writers is his notes from underground. 
And so it was kind of fun to be able to display all three books to show Dostoevsky's literary influences. And then um, in this large panel to the right um, to discuss both the influence of Turgenev on Dostoevsky, the influence of Chernyshevsky on Dostoevsky, and then some of the concepts that Dostoevsky explores in Notes from Underground, um, including the early reference to the Tower of Babel that he will continue throughout his late prophetic novels, especially in Brothers Karamazov. So um, I showed you pretty much the entire exhibition, but instead of um, going through it chronologically, I tried to um, explain to you what were some of the choices we made and how we utilize this um, incredibly gorgeous space to make this exhibition as, um, as all encompassing as possible. And I'm going to um, do this now so you can see me again. And uh, I'm going to have this lovely gambler section behind me. So if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. 